chamber. Today's event promises to be another bumper. We shall be looking at the theme, technology and innovation, creating boundless opportunities. We have on our panel two highly qualified and professional professionals on our panel, two highly qualified and experienced professionals on our panel. We have with us Dr. Ade Shola Ade Dutton, Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer of First Bank Nigeria Limited. We also have Mrs. Kofo Akikube, Managing Director, CEO Secure ID Nigeria and Secure Card Manufacturing. We shall get to meet them later. Once again, I welcome you to this event. Shall we observe the national anthems of Nigeria and Britain? to share our webinar guidelines with you. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. To comment and have discussions, kindly use the chat icon. Please remember to submit your questions via the Q and A icon. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome our president and chairman of council, Mr. Kayode Falowo, to deliver his welcome address. Mr. Falowo, you have the floor.
Thank you very much, uh, Aki Oshutoki. Um, good afternoon, patrons, council members, members of the Nigerian Rich Chamber of Commerce, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am indeed delighted to welcome you to the April 2021 webinar of the Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce. The theme of today's event is technology and innovation, creating boundless opportunities. And it is organized by the programs committee of the chamber, which is ably led by Aki Oshutoki. The MBCC does not require any introduction to many of you on this call. However, for the sake of those who may not be aware of our activities, the chamber is the foremost bilateral chamber in Nigeria and was established in 1977 to promote trade and investment between Nigeria and Britain. The MBCC is affiliated with the British Chambers of Commerce, which gives our members beneficial access to a network of 53 chambers across the United Kingdom and 71 other international affiliates. It's instructive to note that a month ago, when we had uh, our March webinar, there were 66 affiliates. So the number keeps growing. What that tells me is that uh, across the world, people are noticing our activities and are indeed pleased to associate with the chamber. The MBCC carries out various activities targeted at the promotion of trade and investment, advocacy, business incubation, training, business networking, and policy formulation. Today's event is in alignment with some of our cardinal objectives as a chamber, and I am convinced that it will provide a good platform for discussing the various opportunities available for creating bigger and better businesses through the use of technology and innovation. Clearly, the speaker and the moderator of today are very experienced individuals on the subject matter. I'm particularly delighted to also note that the managing director of First Bank is speaking, and First Bank is one of our premium members. The premium membership category of the chamber is one where you are invited to based on our perception and believe about the track record of the organization. And they are indeed, they have indeed become uh, the major platform for uh, supporting the activities of the chamber. One of the fallouts of COVID-19 pandemic is the increasing influence of technology in the way companies across all sectors and geographies do business. Imagine technologies such as cloud computing, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, blockchain technology, 3D printing, and so on and so forth, offer new opportunities for businesses. Technology and innovation have changed the way we approach business, leading to increased productivity, efficiency, and indeed profitability. New technologies are reshaping the role of humans in the function of production and service provision. Technology and innovation have also helped businesses to boost the efficiency of operations, enhance cost management, and enlarge research capabilities. According to McKinsey, 84% of executives say that their future success is dependent on technological innovation. Innovation is therefore critical to growth, particularly as the changes in business cycles become more frequent. Most companies understand the importance of innovation, but sometimes fall short when it comes to the implementation of new ideas that have the potential of changing their existing practices. Technological innovation has also become a vital tool of financial inclusion and economic growth. The World Bank has observed that countries with 
deeper, more developed financial systems achieve higher economic growth and faster reductions in poverty and income equality. Digital technologies are making it possible to bring financial services to about 65% of people in the developing world who either to lack access to those services. It is increasing the speed, security, and transparency of transactions and allowing for development of sustainable financial products tailored to the needs of people with low incomes. Technology is removing the barriers to providing financial services, such as lack of info identification, informal income, and indeed geographical distance. At the chamber, we believe that there is a need for the implementation of new business constructs driven by technology and innovation. To stay competitive in the emerging economic and business environment, institutions require new strategies and practices. Clearly, those who cannot participate in digital transformation and innovative thinking may be left behind. Uh, my prayer uh, for your businesses is that you should not be left behind. Given the foregoing, I am delighted on behalf of the council to introduce today's keynote speaker. He is Dr. Ade Shola Kazi Made Duton, Chief Executive Officer of the First Bank Group. Dr. Ade Duton currently sits on the boards of the African Finance Corporation, FBN Holdings PLC, FBN Bank UK, Shared Agent Network Expansion Group, and Nigeria Interbank Settlement System. Prior to First Bank, was a director and pioneer CFO of AFC. He also served as a senior vice president and CFO at Citibank Nigeria Limited, a senior manager in the financial services group of KPMG Professional Services and a manager at Arthur Anderson. His career in banking and finance spans almost three decades and has earned him various recognitions and awards, including Forbes Best of Africa, Distinguished Alumnus of Cranfield University and the University of Ibadan, and African Banking Personality of the Year 2020. Dr. Adeshola is a member of the Bretton Woods Committee, the Sigma Educational Foundation, the Board of Lagos State Security Trust Fund, and the Governing Council of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. He is also a member of the steering committee of the private sector coalition against COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, it is also my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Mrs. Kofo Akikube, the founder of Secure ID Nigeria and Secure Card Manufacturing, where she currently serves as the managing director, stroke chief executive officer. In addition to these roles, she founded SID Digital Limited, a digital solutions company, as well as Transport Payment Solutions Limited, which is focused on solutions for projects across various transport systems. She's indeed a trailblazing entrepreneur of tremendous energy and courage, passionate about innovative technology, and committed to changing the narrative and manufacturing and gender perspectives in Africa. Mrs. Akekube is a prize winning graduate of mathematics from the University of Lagos and a Shevlin Scholar at the University of Strathclyde Graduate School of Business, Glasgow, UK. She has attended several leadership and personal development programs at leading global institutions, including the London Business School, NCAD in France, the Lagos Business School where she attended the chief executive program. She's also an alumnus of the Harvard Business School Owner President Management Program. She serves currently as a member of the Nigerian Industrial Policy and Competitiveness Advisory Council and the Regulators Forum 
of the FinTech Association of Nigeria. This is Akikube, is also a member of the Executive Committee of the Manufacturing Association of Nigeria. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have no doubt in my mind that attending to this event will be quite beneficial to all of us, given the quality and experience of the speaker and the moderator. I wish to thank you for your attention. And now I have the pleasure to invite our keynote speaker, Dr. Adeshola Adeduton, to give his presentation. Dr. Adeduton. Good afternoon, um, President and Chairman of Council of the Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce, patrons and other members of Council, distinguished um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me start by appreciating the President by inviting me to speak at this uh, particular event. My very deep appreciation also to Mr. Akin Oshuntoki, who, who extended the president's invitation to me. For me, the topic that I've been invited to speak on this afternoon is an exciting one. And that's because it's something that speaks to my passion. It's something that we've, um, that formed the pillar of the transformation that I started when I was appointed as the chief executive of First Bank in January 2016. So it's something I, won't, I will not lay claim to be an expert, but something where I do have very practical experience of what is possible when you make the right investment in people, technology, and technology security, which is what we call cyber security. I've been on record, I've been reported to have stated very clearly that the critical success uh, factor for a great institution, First Bank, which has been in existence for 127 years, it's our ability to continuously invent and reinvent ourselves. And that basically speaks to innovation. I, I look at First Bank today, I look at where we were just even five plus years ago when I had Zoom office. And a new bank has virtually emerged from what it was that we started with because we have been deliberate in terms of investment in technology. We've been very deliberate in making, leveraging emerging technology to promote um, commerce and enhance shareholders' uh, value. Coincidentally, this morning, um, I woke up and on the chat room where, um, one of the numerous chat room where I'm a member, I picked up something that was quite relevant for today's session. And I will seek the permission of the, um, of the president to share that particular uh, video before I proceed. Um, I think it could be, it basically speaks to what we're talking about here. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. There is no audio though. Uh, oh. Maybe you want to check that, the audio. Can you hear? Can you hear the voice now? 
you are yet to share again. Probably when you share now, you want to check the volume. Okay, um, Mr. Edson, let me run you through it. Before you share, there's a tab that says share sound. So once you click on the share icon, it would say, it would ask you to activate your audio. It's a small box. Okay, maybe what we should do is uh, let's... Um... Okay, let me stop this and I go to my presentation pending when I figure out what the problem is with, um, with my audio. Yeah. Or is it something that can be shared, uh, sent to the secretariat? To I would um, send it across to the secretariat. But let me, let me go to my own presentation now. And um, we'll take it forward from there. One minute, please. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So thank you once again, um, President. Um, like I said, um, this is a topic that I'm particularly very excited about uh, because it speaks to a number of things uh, that we've done with um, First Bank since we've been appointed um, as a CEO way back in 2016, January. But more importantly, the, 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 the opportunities that technology and innovation that it opens for a country like Nigeria is huge. And one cannot overemphasize that. In terms of layout, this is the layout of my presentation. I would um, originally cover the, I look at evolution of technology. Um, I will look at technology and innovation in businesses, and I will, use some industry use cases and business adoption. I will subsequently discuss technology and financial inclusion, which coincidentally the president referred to in his earlier opening remark and how First Bank is leveraging technology to promote financial inclusion and assisting the government of Nigeria to achieve its objective as far as um, financial inclusion is concerned. Financial inclusion, as we all know, there's a direct correlation between people having access to financial services and poverty. I also discussed technology development in Nigeria, impact of policies and institutions, and I will make some recommendations regarding bridging the technology gap and how we can address the inhibiting factors. I believe the key point that I want to make at this point is the fact that for those of us who are bankers, especially the people I regard, I refer to as modern day bankers, sometimes we often wonder whether we're in the business of banking or we're in the business of technology. And that's because of the way technology has become uh, woven or an integral part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And you will discover that in most financial institutions, especially banks today, the employees or the staff with technology and digital capabilities are the most, um, they are very scarce and they're also the most expensive in terms of um, um, remuneration. They're also the most mobile in terms of trying to keep your top talent. So moving on, 
I think the key point that I would like to make when I look at the evolution of technology is the fact that significant um, growth in world economy has more often than not been linked with breakthrough in transport and communication technologies. And the literature is, um, is very rich in this particular area. So whether you're looking at the first wave of integration, which was 1815 to 1914, which the, the, the growth that was seen then was actually on the back of advances in ship design and navigation. Or you're looking at the second wave of integration, 1915 to 1979, where improvement in electrification, improvement in rail design, advent of high-speed train, intermodal freight, and other innovation basically drove reduction in transport costs. Or you're looking at the wave of technology, which is the ICT-8, 1980 to 2020, where significant improvement in global economy has been driven by innovations in telecommunications, computing, and the global information network. So there's that direct correlation. The, the, the better the communication and the transportation technology becomes, the better the growth that has been recorded. And for the fourth industrial revolution, the future of technology, the expectation is that that will fundamentally reshape our world even more than what we are seeing today. And we only just need to look back at the phenomenal changes that the world has experienced in the last 15 years. Uh, today, we take it for granted that, um, the example I love to cite here, it's when you speak with our fathers, especially those who school abroad, they will tell you that they all went to school in England and they, they traveled by ship. And we want to, when they want to communicate with their families back in Nigeria, they will have to do a manual letter, write a letter. And that letter typically takes somewhere between 60 days to 90 days for it to get to its destination. So in short, you could go for three, four, five months without hearing back from your loved ones in Nigeria. Today, virtually all of us have kids who are schooling either in Canada, in the US or UK or Australia, or colleagues or friends working in those different locations. And with what technology has made possible, whether by FaceTime or WhatsApp or whatever means, you can not just even speak with them almost on the dial, you could see them, feel the way they are doing. And it's quite phenomenal what technology has done and is still doing in our different uh, lives. Moving on with my presentation. As at the end of 2020, the estimated value of e-commerce transaction on the global scale is put at about 27.7 trillion US dollars. And that's quite significant. And what has made this possible is technology. So digital technology, and I was very excited when the president referred to artificial intelligence, internet of things, additive manufacturing, and blockchain. All of these are built on foundation of um, exponential rise in computer computing power, bandwidth, and digital information. Again, technology and innovation are reshaping consumer habits. And we, all, we just need to look down, uh, look back at what has happened to the entire world in the last 15 months of the COVID pandemic, where even though that transition has started, the well, COVID pandemic has essentially accelerated the movement from touch points to contactless means of communication, contactless means of transacting. People truly, because of fear of COVID, do not want to see, do not want to physically touch anything today. People want to be able to sit in the comfort of their own, order groceries, uh, make payments, everything that they would like to do typically when they go out. So, and what is making this possible is technology, but it's not just technology, it's innovation riding 
on the back of technology. And what we've seen is um, for people, for institutions that have innovation as an integ as, a, as part of their DNA, they are seizing the opportunity that the current environment uh, uh, provides. But more importantly, the possibilities that are being thrown up with digital technology is being exploited in a very, very massive uh, way. One point that I would like to make before I move on to the next slide is that what technology and innovation has done is to create easier entry into various industry, increase product diversity, and it's made it easier for firms to produce, promote, and distribute their product at a lower cost. And the examples are banned around us. So the power and the technology and innovation gives to us as a businessman is enormous, but it's also a factor of how well we are able to leverage and use that power. Let me step back, and this basically speaks to what the president mentioned in his opening remark, and go through maybe about two or three comments from global business leaders, academia, and political leaders. And that basically speaks to the power of innovation and ability to continuously reinvent your institution or yourself. Um, because at the end of the day, it's the individual that makes up the institution. And like I said, for us at First Bank, we believe a key, arguably the most important critical success factor that has enabled our institution to be in existence, not just in existence, we've remained a dominant player in the banking and financial service sector is this ability to reinvent ourselves. And look at the comment three from Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft. He said, longevity in this business is about being able to reinvent yourself or invent the future. Amit Zavari, VP and head of platform at Google Cloud, he said, think of digital transformation less as a technology project to be finished than as a state of perpetual agility. I want my audience to listen carefully here. Perpetual agility. When you think of perpetual agility, it's a continuous state of flux because you can't be, you cannot even afford to be satisfied with where you are today because competition and even the environment itself is in a state of um, evolution, if not revolution. And any attempt by any business leader to sit on their hearts thinking that we have arrived or thinking that they built what we used to call um, competitive advantage that would be difficult for any other person to, 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 to meet. It's a mirage. Jeff Bessel, president and chairman of Amazon, he said, in today's era of volatility, there's no other way but to reinvent through innovation. The only sustainable competitive advantage you can have over others is agility, and that's it. Agility being meaning continuously just reinventing yourself, managing, I mean, looking around you, thinking about the new possibilities. If you cannot, if you are not agile, if agility is not in your DNA, that means even if you are innovative, you'll be very slow to market. And in this era of VOCA, where the environment is volatile, there's so much uncertainty, so much ambiguity. Innovation without agility itself, it it's, will not take you there. So it both has to go hand in hand, and that's quite uh, very important. Let me, let's look at some of the comments from uh, other segment people. Look at the comment from the Premier of the People's Republic of China. Changes call for innovation, and innovation leads to progress. When you look at a country like China, and you look at the development that has happened in that country between 1980 and now, you cannot but appreciate the power of innovation and what innovation potentially can do. This is one country that has lifted about um, more than 700 million people out of poverty. So that's, there's a direct correlation between 
creating wealth, innovation, and lifting people out of uh, poverty. Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, he said, we are extending the innovation assistance program to continue supporting innovative businesses across the country. Canada is pitching itself to the world as a high tech hotbed. Again, this is a country that is being very deliberate in terms of attracting talent, in terms of positioning itself as a country where high tech it, um, is it. The same is applicable to Israel. If you go to Israel, the high tech industry in Israel is state of the art. Michael Potter, the very popular American strategy academic, he said, innovation is a central issue in economic prosperity. Because without innovation, the kind of quantum growth that nations, businesses that we desire will be impossible. And I'm going to go, not only because of this presentation, I'm going to cite some specific examples in terms of what technology has made possible. Now, let's talk about technology and innovation in businesses. Um, the president said the board. Examples of how businesses are using Internet of Things to get their businesses into better position. So retailers in developed countries, for example, they now use IoT to transform their supply chain by attaching sensors on their containers, which allows them to estimate the time of arrival of their goods. So they basically use modern technology to promote their inventory management system. So when we, those of us that went to business school 10, 20, 30 years ago, when we speak of just-in-time inventory management system, what IoT has made possible is that it makes it even more, it allows you to even cut it so close because of what is possible. Fanuc, a robotics uh, company, they leverage IoT to predict the failure of a component. In a, in, a, in a manufacturing company. Does, and what that does is that it reduces downtime. But they can say with some degree of precision that a particular component will fail, give or take, let's say in the month of May. And what that does is that they can proactively acquire the spares required to fix that. Let's talk about drones. Unfortunately, the video I wanted to show was a video I saw this morning of a company that is based in the Asian city of Ibadan, which where I come from, very proud, uh, very proudly, uh, where they basically um, develop a drone that they believe can assist the security agencies to locate kidnappers. And the catch in there is that they fix it with a carbon dioxide sensor. So when this um, drone flies over the bush because typically kidnappers take their, their victims into the bush, into the jungle. The sensor is active enough to be able to peak higher level of carbon dioxide emission, which is expected when you have a concentration of people more than it used to be in the neighborhood. That way, that drone can assist the security agencies to pinpoint with some degree of precision the neighborhood where the victims are being kept. So what we are seeing with drones, for example, is that its usage is even going beyond military and security purposes. We've seen Amazon that has piloted this drone delivery uh, system, Amazon Hair Prime Services. We've also seen another company, Asiad Express, launch several pilots relating to the use of drones uh, for the purpose of delivery. So, these technologies are real. They are being used to enhance customer experience and make money, obviously, for the company. Let me discuss virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, so 
the good example to cite here is um, IKEA's Place app, for example, that enables consumers to see how furniture will look and fit into their interior without How, how your kitchen or your living room will look like after placing the furniture. So, so that way, it enhances your decision making uh, in terms of uh, in terms of um, your purchase. Robotics, and this is one area where I mean, this is one thing I love a lot. Robotics generally they reduce the role of labor. And the example I, I've cited two examples that both of them are in the banking sector. Deutsche Bank reported that they leverage robotics to automate their AML detection activities, and they saved a whopping 210,000 daily man hours. In, in substance, this translates to saving of about 120 head counts. We all know what it means to even hire one head count. So just imagine a robot a robot that saves you from hiring 120,000 uh, permanent or temporary headcount. Well, because these are recurring transactions, even if you make them uh, contracts, have their, their impact. So you could imagine, so the impact of robotics on business can be quite significant. At Trust Bank, for example, we've just deployed a robotics to automate some of our settlement and reconciliation activities. And the turnaround time reduced from two weeks to about to less than four hours. So again, these are use cases. Of course, blockchain is one popular technology that um, uh, we are all quite uh, familiar with in terms of its use. I'm putting artificial intelligence. Is this was one of the things, uh, the modern technology that the president referred to? Not just Sri Bank. The example that we have cited is a Sri Bank partner with VC to integrate its software into the bank's fraud detection processes. Indeed, today, in the banking industry, and what we use is not any different. Most fraud detection solution, they leverage artificial intelligence. So, when, because we have, an, we, have we do, banks typically have a history of the way their customer transact. So if my customer is typically someone that does transaction, let's say in the range of 20,000 to 50,000. So that pattern has already been fully established. If suddenly he or she steps forward on someone, if, um, and in, um, an impersonator, get hold of some of our access card, whether it's an, an ATM card or the login details, and try to do an out of pattern transaction. Let's say suddenly the person wanted to withdraw 100,000. The fraud solution detection system will pick it that this is an out of pattern behavior. It could even be in terms of location. Historically, this customer typically sends money, just to make the point, to Abuja, maybe because the son or daughter is schooling in Abuja. If suddenly this same person that is wanted to send money to Meduguri, for example, or to Ipad, the solution has the capacity to solve it. And there are many part of our businesses that lend themselves to the usage of artificial intelligence. I've just used fraud solution just as an example. Data analytics. Big data analytics is one area where banks and telcos and even huge large departmental stores have used the leverage data analytics to build distinctive marketing capabilities. So for example, our bank, we leverage data analytics to improve our understanding of our customers' needs and to help them to get insight into their behavior and do what we call next line of purchase. Uh, again, 
the importance of data analytics cannot be overemphasized. We're all of us, when we get to the, whether the till point or we're about to pay, you suddenly notice that um, the system is recommending, do you want to pick up this? That's because they've seen that people that bought solution A typically tend to buy solution B. So that's why. So data and it's, that's on the back of artificial intelligence layered on top of data analytics. So data analytics is, big data analytics is a very, very important part of the new business architecture. Indeed, the consensus is that data is the new good. Um, if, as, a, as an institution, if you are not investing in big data analytics today, then you are clearly falling behind because you will have data, you will not be able to predict how your customers, how they would like to transact, what they will, how, what they would like to transact on, what is likely to be their next uh, move. Moving forward, I've also put forward examples of government agencies using all this modern technology. I've cited the example of the video that I tried to show, use of drone. But here, Rwanda government, the Ministry of Health there, they make use of drone to in, in the area of health care. So again, it goes back to the point that most of these modern technologies, they actually do have what I call um, multi-purpose usages. So, so the United States uh, Security Agency, they leverage the big data analysis capability to analyze data set and deduce information and patterns, which help them to proactively manage security threats and maintain national security. In the UK, they make use of robotics. The police, they utilize robotic process automation to perform repetitive and time-consuming processes. So thereby, higher level of efficiency, but higher degree of precision. Um, so moving on, um, What will it take? In my view, businesses must work to embed technology and innovation in their DNA, um, deploying what we call technology first approach, whether they are looking at internal or external core operational processes. And this is what we have basically this is the agenda that we have been pushing since I was appointed a CEO of First Bank. And what does that entail, actually? Um, one, you must be willing to invest in new technology. In fact, first and foremost, you must first of all take care of what I call the baseline technology. Because most of this modern technology, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's um, robotics, they sit over your core technology. So you invest, you must also build resilience. So for, for us in the banking sector, for example, it's not just about investing in customer facing technology. We've also had to make significant investment in cyber security. Because as you, you are making investment to create and delight your customer. The, they said for everything, there's a good side and there's a bad side. The, the criminals around are also looking at what you are doing and they are looking for a loophole through which they can defraud individuals of their hard earned money. So you must also, it's not just about investing in technology. You must also invent, invest in what I call resilience, cybersecurity, ensure that uh, your system is protected against fraudster. For you to be successful in embedding technology and innovation in your DNA, the culture of the institution has to change because most, especially for institutions that are relatively advanced in age, the DNA of those institutions is not technology. The DNA of those institutions may be innovation, but innovation in a different context and innovation in a different climate. So there's always a need to revamp the culture to ensure the culture, to ensure that culture of innovation and deep appreciation of technology is ingrained in the DNA 
of the institution. Of course, investment in staff is critical in terms of training, getting your staff exposed to development globally, and even your in the local environment to support your own investment. Because you could invest in the best of technology. If the people that are meant to use and leverage the technology, if they are technologically illiterate, then you will not get the kind of upside that you are expecting to, 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 to get. Moving forward, Now, I want to speak about technology and financial inclusion. Again, if there's an area where we at First Bank are extremely proud of what we have achieved over the last five years, is in the area of financial inclusion. But what we've done is that we've used technology. We've leveraged technology in a very innovative way to, to push our financial inclusion agenda. And financial inclusion, like I previously explained, is directly linked to poverty elevation. Access to financing is a critical ingredient of addressing poverty. So when the government of Nigeria sets itself a very ambitious target in terms of where we want to get to um, as a nation, in terms of financial inclusion, we at First Bank, about five years ago, we stepped back and say, how can we make money while doing good? And what exactly do I mean? We said to ourselves, we can make use of this financial inclusion. We can make good money while assisting government to address the financial inclusion challenge. And by assist, addressing the financial inclusion target, we are basically um, helping government to address poverty. What do we use? Um, essentially, we leverage um, digital KYC process and biometrics um, uh, and biometrics. We've also made use of uh, mobile wallet, mobile mobile money and e-wallet to assist um, in promoting financial inclusion. And I'll come to a slide shortly that speaks to that. Today, with um, this slide speaks to what First Bank has achieved with our agency banking proposition, First Money. Today, we say with pride that our bank, First Bank, we have built the largest bank led agent network not just in Nigeria, actually, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Because today we have over 100,000 active first money agents across the nooks and crannies of Nigeria, providing financial services to people at the base of the pyramid, people that were either to financially excluded. So, and what do we do in all these locations? We assist, we assist them with BVN enrollment. We open, we open accounts for them and they're able to perform basic banking services, cash in, cash out. They can make transfer, they can pay bills, they can make payments. And we're working on layering additional products and services at all this point. And the spread of our agents across the country is what you can see. By far, we had the largest in, uh, in Lagos and uh, Oyo State. Sorry, Lagos and Edo, and Edo State, followed by Oyo State. We've also been very particular in the Northeast and the Northwest because those areas from a geopolitical uh, zoning, it's, they have the least or they have the highest level of uh, financial exclusion. So we've been very active also promoting um, the, um, uh, first money agents in those locations. 
Since inception, we've processed over 580 million transactions. What about 12 trillion? So it's an Among Us um, network that we do put together, leveraging technology, leveraging, addressing, assisting government to address poverty. Over and above what we have done with um, our agency banking network, which, like I said, is by far the largest uh, bank-led agency banking um, system or infrastructure in this part of the world. We've also leveraged technology. Today, as First Bank, we have 16 million customers transacting actively on our various digital platforms. Um, so whether you're thinking about our USSD uh, platform, which is the Star 894, or you are thinking of um, our first mobile banking app and our ATM system. We have about 16 million active customers. We've recorded more than five times growth in transaction volume on our data channels over the last three years in terms of count. And we've recorded over six times growth in transaction values on those digital channels also over the last uh, three years. And We've gone from basic to what I call advanced, where on all these digital platforms, we keep layering additional solutions, additional services. So if you look at our first mobile today, first mobile app, we've enhanced the mobile app with new and improved features that promote safety and convenient banking. And not only have we, have we done this successfully in Nigeria, We've also successfully launched this first mobile banking app across all the six other African countries where we are operating. So whether you are in DRC or you are in Ghana, you will see and you will be able to use our first uh, mobile app. We've used our, we've created what we call the fast track ATM, which enable our customers to use their mobile phones to remotely initiate ATM-based cash withdrawal, either using our um, USSD code, star 894, using our first mobile application. And our corporate customers are not left out. We have a platform, First Direct, which is an integrated cash and trade management platform that string collections and payments together, allow our corporate customers to manage not just their collections and payment, they also can do their trade businesses and trade transactions on this. So again, all these, the seeds we leverage all these modern technologies that we have uh, discussed. And of course, like I mentioned, cybersecurity is extremely important because when you have 16 million customers transacting actively on your platform daily, clearly the folks who are interested in crime would want to penetrate your system. Today, First Bank will process somewhere between 20 to 22% of the volume of digital transactions in the Nigerian banking sector. I move on to the section around technology development in Nigeria. What is the role of government? What should government be doing to assist, to promote um, technology innovations in our country. And I've tried to articulate them um, around five pillars. For me, government need to articulate and implement enabling and business-friendly program and actions. And that's quite critical. We all heard what the Prime Minister of Canada said. Um, I'm aware that NITSDA is doing a lot, but a lot still needs to be done for businesses, uh, government to create business-friendly policy that support and encourage private sector involvement in research and development, investment and development and harnessing technology. It's also important that um, government continues to invest in what I call critical and supporting infrastructure, broadband, 
uh, is very important. Lane of fiber optic cables that makes, that enhances computing power, irrespective of where, where you are. The nations that have made the kind of progress that we would love to make in the area of technology and innovation. Government clearly does have a role to play in providing critical support infrastructure. There's also the angle of creating a very attractive foreign direct investment policy actions and program that allows foreign investors to come and want to invest in this area within our economy. There has to be deliberate technology and innovation policy trust. Um, specifically here, I'm speaking to how do we continue to build a critical mass of the younger generations and drive them towards science, towards technology. Because without science and technology, you cannot leverage technology. So how do we, how do we string together the right policy around technology and innovation? Today, we are all aware of what India has achieved as a nation when it comes to information and um, communication technology. I actually believe that Nigeria as a country, we do have um, our opportunity, we do have better opportunity. So for example, we, we, we sit very close to GMT. So in terms of time zone, how can we make Nigeria to become the hub for outsourcing, for example? We all, English is also the official language, yeah. But without the right manpower, those outsourcing will continue to go somewhere else. Without those enabling critical infrastructure, like power, um, in, investment in um, um, broadband and technology, we will not be able to attract them. And those are multi-billion dollars business, the outsourcing business. And that's why this point about the role of government is extremely important because potentially what that can contribute to our GDP is probably left to imagination. And like I said, um, the Indian model is there for us to, to study, review, and adapt. Knowledge and innovation-based educational curriculum and programs, again, this tie back to the previous point. We need a critical mass of people well-educated, who have the right skills, the right attitude, the right um, uh, mindset to, 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 to grow this sector of the economy. Moving forward, how do we bridge the technology gap? In my view, to fully harness the opportunity that technology and innovation present to the economy, the factors that are limiting technology and innovation growth in Nigeria must be addressed. Um, we've spoken about supporting infrastructure. We have discussed about skilled labor. You, I mean, even if you have the infrastructure, if you don't have the skills required to run those infrastructure and leverage those infrastructure. So I would say the need to build critical support infrastructure like I've highlighted. We must also go back to the era where both government and the private sector were funding research. What I call um, practical and usable research. Research that are relevant to the industry. Um, so we have to go back to the era where we need to continue to do that. We need to establish technology hubs across the country. When you look at the level of unemployment in the country, one way or one of the ways by which you can address unemployment in this country, it's basically given um, technology skills and capabilities to, to the younger generations and align them to express themselves. Not just in terms of employment creation, 
people can easily become entrepreneurs. And we've seen loads and loads of examples in the recent time where Nigerians, Africans have uh, basically delighted the world with what they've created. What we need to do is to turn the entire country to a technology hub where it's not just about the drone that I mentioned in the battle. Some folks are working in Akure, some are working in Kaduna, some are working in Oka, and different things are doing. So that way, we can positively channel the energy, the creativity of the younger uh, generation, uh, the younger folks, positively in this direction. Obviously, uh, the last point there is also very important. The government must formulate policy that encourages businesses to adopt technology in their businesses. Rounding up, like I said at the beginning, this is a very, very exciting uh, topic. Is um, is an area where things are still evolving. Um, technology keeps. Um, um, they are, they, 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 I mean, there's an ongoing revolution in short. And let me also mention the fact that um, just to underscore the importance of innovation, I've always said any institution that bet against innovation would become a dinosaur. And the business um, graveyard, for want of a better word, is filled with companies that are filled either to predict the trend or they do not have the agility to read what is required. We all remember BlackBerry. I'm sure we all remember Kodak. Kodak was synonymous with photography at a point in time, but they did not predict correctly. Although there's a story that says that even when this modern technology, that uh, photography was presented to them, they believed it cannot scale. So what am I saying here? Whether as individuals running small businesses or people that are running large enterprises. Innovation, agility, and leveraging technology, they are like the baseline of what is expected of management and board in today's world. If you don't innovate, if you don't have the agility, which means the ability to read, respond very quickly in terms of time to market, you can wake up the following day and you are completely out, your business is out. There was a quote that was attributed to the MD of, um, I forgot in this, um, this uh, phone manufacturer, the one that is based in Norway, the name just escaped me. Um, and he basically said, we did not do anything wrong. Essentially, when you not care, not care was the name I was trying to remember. So, but what they did not do or they did not read is the way the market was moving. And suddenly, not care that was synonymous with mobile phone, some 10 years ago, when you see the schedule of um, the top names in mobile phone today, you are, they are they, 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 they're not there. So that basically speaks to the importance of um, innovation. If you don't innovate or you don't have the agility to innovate very, very quickly, because of the volatile nature of the world where we are currently operating, you can just wake up and the following morning, um, you are virtually out of business. So I will pause here and I'll be happy to take uh, questions from members of the chamber and the audience. Thank you, Mr. President and members of council. Wow. Wow, thank you very much, um, Dr. Adeshola Adedutor. This has been an extremely insightful, insightful and incisive um, session, but I know that there is something for everyone. I mean, for me, there's, it, it's been extremely insightful. So before we go to the Q&A um, session, 
Can we please pause a bit and listen to the, a very short advert? Thank you. Hello and welcome to this information video. Today we want to talk to you about First Direct, the new global transaction banking platform from First Bank. First Direct is an innovative product that covers a wide range of transaction banking services we offer via a single portal. These are Before we take an in-depth look into these seven smart reasons to choose First Direct, let's view some of its features. Number one, account services. Number two, e-payments. Number three, collections and receivables. Number four, liquidity management. Number five, supply chain finance. Number six, trade services. Number seven, host to host or web services. And if you're still in doubt, let's leave you with seven dynamic reasons to be on the First Direct platform, which we call the First Direct Promise. So what are you waiting for? Get on the First Direct portal today. Remember that First Bank has been established since 1894. So you know your transactions are 100% safe. Thanks for watching. First Bank, you first. Wow. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation, um, Dr. Adishola de Duton. That was extremely, I mean, I, I'm sure we already have loads of questions um, in the chat um, for you. But just, just to quickly, you know, um, our speaker took us through, you know, I like the way he started with, you know, looking at the history of technology, taking us through the first wave, the second wave, and then zooming into what he called the fourth industrial revolution, which is the age that we're, we're in. And he, he made it very important that businesses uh, that has innovation as their DNA and uses technology to drive that innovation uh, are there for the big wins. Um, he also talked about being perpetually agile as well, and that you ought to know that you're in a continuous state of flux. So you have to keep inventing and reinventing yourself through innovation and using technology to, to drive it. And he talked about some of these modern technologies, the IoT, the AI, um, 3D printing, virtual reality, robotics, and talked about some of the use cases as well. Um, but for businesses, he advises that um, we should not always stay where we are, but that we should use technology to enhance customer experience. We should make use of big data for data analytics. Uh, we should use technology to increase our competitive advantage. And we should always be ready to invest in technology. On the other hand, we should also build resilience by ensuring that on the cybersecurity aspect, 
um, were also investing in that. Um, it talked about the culture of the institution uh, um, has to change and needs to be, has to have the culture of innovation and deep appreciation of technology. And it mentioned a lot of the good things that FBN is doing to deepen financial inclusion and the agency network onboarding more customers on their digital platforms. And then he talked about how can we, he mentioned some of the gaps that we have in our environment. Um, what does government need to do to, to bridge those gaps? He talked about infrastructure. He talked about different policies that attracts um, foreign, foreign direct investment. He talked about education, refocusing education to science and technology. And um, talking about establishing technology hubs. And so many more. I'm sure these um, the presentation will be um, shared by everyone. But thank you so much, Dr. Adeshola. We have so many questions. Um, I don't know. I hope we're able to to take every one of them. And thank you all for for answering your questions. And please come up with a lot more. Um, first question is: You know, Nigeria is currently leading the continent in um, in the application of technology in the financial industry. How do we extend this to other countries in Africa? Um, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. It's, um, it's correct to say that if there's any sector where this country, where we've made significant progress in terms of deployment of technology and innovation is in the banking sector. In my view, there are two things that is, in fact, primarily one uh, uh, event that I believe will allow um, Nigerian banks to export what we're doing here. And I'm not too, I'm sure we will have discussed this as a Chamber of Commerce, that is the coming into force of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, which basically is seeking to create a single market on the continent of Africa. Coincidentally, banking is in the phase, first phase of the implementation of that. Um, so, for example, a, a bank like ours, we are present in about six other jurisdictions across the continent. We do have ambitions to expand our footprint on the continent. And wherever we go, we go with our full suite of products. So I mentioned during the course of my presentation, for example, that whether you, are, whether you are in Kinshasa or you're in Konakri, you will see that our customers are using the mobile app, you know? So already the, the train has left the station in terms of Nigerian banks exporting this uh, innovation elsewhere. It's not yet um, Pan-African, but when you look at the ambitions of most Nigerian banks, I'm aware at least the big five banks uh, virtually all of us have some pan-African regional expansion plan. And I'm aware that a bank like us, we're even accelerating our own on, in the aftermath of the coming into force of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So my expectation is that in another three to five years, most of what we have here will become pan-African, African-wide kind of in initiatives. What we're also seeing, we're also beginning to see financial institutions across the continent um, collaborating and cooperating more. And we've also seen uh, the likes of African Development Bank and Afrexit stepping forward because of their mandate to promote growth, economic growth and development across the continent, stepping forward to also get people to work together across the continent. So, so that's why I think it's going to work. It's already um, working in a number of countries and I expect us a number of us expand our footprint on the continent, those technology and those solutions will become Pan-African. Wow, that's, that's very good. I mean, especially with the African trade agreement um, coming into, into play or starting up. Um, we have a quick question here on FinTech and blockchain technology, um, specifically on crypto and digital currency. And it says, what are the plans to introduce government regulated digital currency for payments and transactions, rather than what we have now, which is the recent ban imposed by the CBN. Thank you. Um, 
what I can say, I'm not the regulator, so I'm, I'm not working at Central Bank, but uh, by virtue of my role, um, I do work very closely with the leadership at the Central Bank. Um, what I can say is that um, I'm, I know for sure, knowing the nature of the people at the MOVA at the Central Bank, that they are continuously, they actually are, they are for innovation. So that's number one. And um, so, for example, recently they released a Central Bank of Nigerian guideline on, on open banking. So mm. I'm, a, I'm sure they are doing their own homework. Regulators, by definition, would like to do things after they have a better understanding of it. Uh, because if you don't understand it, how can you regulate it? And that is part of the reason why we've been able to have a safe financial system. Um, some of these um, new technologies, some of these innovations, it's good to innovate, but you must innovate within defined um, framework as defined by the regulators. And like I said, we do have a very progressive uh, central bank. I'm sure in the fullness of time, they will come out with an official pronouncement on how we're going to move forward. When you see what they've done with the open banking policy framework, you could see that the central bank is thinking actively about innovation in the country and in the banking sector specifically. Hmm. Yes, thank you very much for that. There's so many questions here. Uh, how, how do we bridge the gap between academia and industries in Nigeria towards economic transformation of research work? How do we bridge that gap between academia and industries in Nigeria towards economic trans um, transformation of research work, which, which you alluded to about, you know, how we need to um, invest in R&D. Those are one of the things that government needs to do as well. Yeah, in, in, in my view, um, the cooperation between what I call the town and the gown, we need to strengthen that collaboration um, to ensure that researches that are being conducted, they are relevant to our aspiration as various industries and as a country. And, and that's how the academia can get the private sector to put money behind certain research. I would like to use the example of the University of Ibadan, uh, where for this singular purpose, they actually created an office of a deputy vice chancellor in, in, in charge of a research, innovation, and strategic partnership. And the designation of that office just basically speaks to, to the ambition of the University of Ibadan in terms of not just research, they said research, innovation, and strategic partnership. What they are seeking to do is partner with the industry to do research that are um, relevant and applicable to certain industry so that we can all evolve. And for me, um, in many sectors, we are seeing this evolving. Um, but are we where we need to get to? The answer is no. When you look at the kind of research that is going on around agriculture, for example, where research institutes, universities are coming out with um, newer varieties of seeds that are either more productive or are more resistant to, uh, um, to, to pest. That's the way to go in terms of collaboration. So for me, it's about um, the stakeholders sitting down identifying the areas that are important to the, um, to the business community, having an alignment and the business community also putting uh, what I call the relevant resources behind those uh, research. Uh, is the way to go. Um, it's not every time that you want to go abroad to go and leverage it. And most of the time, some of what is being done abroad they are not directly relevant to our domestic environment. And that's why we need to stimulate the, um, we need to re-stimulate research that are relevant to the industry across, whether it's in the area of ICT, whether it's in security, 
whether it's in agriculture, whatever it is, we need to bring back fully that culture of collaboration between the town and the gang. Thank you very much. Um, there seems to be a lot of questions on education and so on. I mean, someone is saying, okay, while appreciating the importance of technology and sustainability, are we not pained by its erosion of the humanity in us? Um, job loss and all, you know. So uh, we're talking about robotics and different technology. How does that, um, how does that affect, you know, job losses and so on? Okay, I'm happy to answer that. Um, what I've seen is that when you introduce technology, what it does is that it basically empowers you to take your staff away from jobs or tasks that they are not even enjoying. Because in reality, I look back at when we started our lives as a junior accountants and bankers you are put in a department where you are reconciling account every day. Today, most institutions have moved away from that. They do have technology solution that does that. But people have not been sacked. People have basically been moved to what we call higher value, more exciting roles. So, for, and that's where the ability of the individuals, you recall when I use the word invent and reinvent, I said it's not just applicable to companies or organizations. It's also applicable to individuals. So if you don't continuously invest in yourself, you not just that um, an organization can become a dinosaur, individuals can also become a dinosaur because the skill set and the capabilities that you have can become dated. And when become dated, that means you are no longer trainable you cannot be moved on to other jobs. I've seen, and I've been around for a while, I've seen a situation where with introduction of new solutions, you go to a department, you have 20, 30 people there, you try to retrain, maybe you can only find 30, 40% of people there that are even ready to learn new skills and capabilities. And then those are the people you want to keep and reabsorb. The other ones, because they are no longer having the skill set you require, then they will have to let go. So the secret of success mm -hmm. in this season of high volatility, where the solutions that work yesterday may not necessarily be the solution today, is for individuals to continuously equip themselves with relevant skills and capabilities. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a question here directed at First Bank, um, beyond the mobile agent system, what other specific areas does First Bank leverage on financial inclusion for poverty reduction? I know you mentioned a lot of the um, digital solution products you have and how you've deepened financial inclusion, but it's saying that beyond the agency network, the mobile agent system, what other specific areas does First Bank leverage on financial inclusion for poverty reduction? Okay. First and foremost, we are not uh, a development agency. We are a business. But what we also try, what we try to do with the agency bank is to do good while trying to make money. And I don't have the statistics readily, readily available. What we know is that for each first money agent that we have, on the average, they have employed like four or five people. So, in, so if you imagine that today we have about 100,000 agents, we've provided employment for about 500,000 people. So, and that's quite um, significant um, when, when you are looking at the issue of uh, addressing poverty. So there are other things that we're doing. So for example, we, we've been very active in promoting um, female businesses and female entrepreneurs using our first gem product. Again, an integral part of doing business but also doing good that help people to address, uh, to, to, to help in the country to address uh, poverty. What is most important, it's our own focus. Knowing fully well that uh, we pride ourselves as being woven to the fabric of this society to continue to operate in a very responsible manner. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much for that. There's a very passionate question here. <laughs> um, and it says, it, the, the person wants to know your thought with respect to localizing technology in our own environment. Um, he said, for example, you talked about Deutsche Bank deploying robots in its environment where per capita is about $20,000 with unemployment at about 10%. Then comparing that with us here, where 3,000 per capita, uh, 3,000 naira and about 40% unemployment, uh, that it seems um, in, in, incongruent to him. Um, and that, you know, it's sure that the cost of training manpower in First Bank will not match cost of robots to automate settlement. And even if it does, probably in the short term. So, um, his opinion is that in the long term, we will continue to decimate our human capital to Canada and the like until we are faced with a collapse system. So what are your thoughts on this and how to deliberately engage policymakers on how not to replace an already underpaid human capital with technology? I guess it's something that um, someone had asked before, you know. Uh -huh. Thank you, um, Madam Moderator. Um, it's important, the first point to make is that the cost of robotics is, because these are machines that are manufactured, can never be as high as the cost of keeping people. However, I've already also explained that at least in the financial services sector, the banking sector that we are quite familiar with, what we have been doing is that we are taking our people away from repetitive, non-value adding roles. And we are taking those people to go and do something or things that are more exciting. Now, if you, when we speak about domesticating um, technology, I wish I could get that video of that um, Ibadan uh, Artificial Intelligence Center today. So what technology holds for us goes beyond what I've said. You could see what they are trying to do. Imagine for a moment that Nigerian government buys their solution. Then the growth of that company that is based in Ibadan will be phenomenal. Because what I mean, the implication is that people, they will employ more people to be able to meet the demand for their drones. They will continuously improve on the drones that they manufacture, and those drones can be used for other easy. For me, even though technology deployment does have some downside, the upside is so huge, it's so huge. And I go back to the example of India that I cited, where I said, India over the last 30 years, they've created an amazing um, ICT um, industry that has turned India to the hub of outsourcing. When you think of technology today, over and above the developed world, you think of India. And if you look at the, the volume of uh, businesses that have been outsourced and are now located in India on account of the technology base that they've created, you could see what is possible for us as a country. I mentioned two other additional factors that I believe work in our favor. We are native English speakers. Everybody, once you started primary one, you learn English. So we actually speak English as the official language. So, and English is the official language of commerce globally, at least until maybe Mandarin down the line. But for today, English is the official language of business. Secondly is we are located at or very close to GMT, which means everybody can reference us, our time zone. And it's easy. so for me, one area I believe entrepreneurs and government should be focusing on, not just technology for the sake of technology, is how can we be deliberate in developing our capabilities and skill in technology and make Nigeria a hub for outsourcing. To do that, we need to work on all the things I've discussed. Manpower, providing power, 
as in electricity and um, enhancing the computing capabilities local, which is providing all the critical telco infrastructure, which is uh, fiber optic cables and uh, broadband yeah. technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shola. Um, there's, there's a question again directed at First Bank. The First Bank just launched First Global Transfer, which allows money transfer in and out of Nigeria to Ghana, to Gambia, to Senegal. Can you give us a glimpse of other technological innovations to expect from First Bank? You know, and I will just merge that with the next question, which says that, you know, what is First Bank? How can First Bank help to encourage the study of STEM subjects? and to produce experts in new technologies. Okay. Um, the example I would like to give in terms of other things that we're doing is the first direct that uh, the advert that was shown when I completed my presentation. And that basically speaks to our integrated cash and trade management solution through which our corporate customers, they can do virtually anything. They can make payment to vendors, they can pay salaries, they can see, they can view their account balances, even in other banks, through this particular solution. They can initiate their trade, they can, they can initiate their trade from the comfort of their office. It's, it's a solution, it's a platform that we're very, very proud of. So the second question regarding, um, what was the second question again? Um, um, oh gosh, um, I think it was talking about how can First Bank encourage, you know, STEM, STEM education. Again, we have been supporting Nigerian universities um, by endowing professorial chairs. One of the things that we also did during the in the in the in the in the aftermath of this COVID pandemic was that we went into some strategic alliances with IBM and Microsoft. And I believe, uh, yeah, at least IBM and Microsoft, where we are trading Nigerians on all these new technology that I mentioned, whether it's internet of things, whether it's uh, artificial intelligence, basically trying to give the next generation, the younger ones, capabilities in digital technologies that yeah. basically enhances their own marketability. So as an institution, that's what we're doing. Um, like I said, we are a responsible corporate entity. We are woven to the fabric of this society, but we are not a full-time charity organization. So our CSR is measured, but we ensure that it is very impactful. Um, again, you will have read that when COVID hit the shore of Nigeria, we were in the forefront of e-learning, where we supported um, government to move people away from brick and mortar to some degree of digital or virtual learning. So those are the things that we're doing. Yes, thank you so much. So just, just one last one. You know, Europe and North America, they've done, they've been able to achieve unified boundless communication. And this has had a major multiplier um, effect on technology and innovation. Is this something Africa should put in the front burner from now on? I, I believe this will come on the back of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. The reason why Europe has achieved that and America has achieved that is that they are, Europe is regarded as a single market. So whether you're in Spain or you're in, um, in Belgium or you're in the Netherlands, is you are deemed to be in a local environment. So, and that's where trading is, I mean, it's almost like borderless and the technology and telecommunication follow the same thing. So when you look at our ambition as a continent, when you read, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the objectives, you could see that that is where we are headed. So similar to my response about uh, banks moving to other locations, I believe that in the very near future, telcos will also have to recognize that Africa as a continent 
And as a single trading block, you might no longer need to be treating those countries as different jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, well, <laughs> there is, even though we're about to finish that, but there is one question that, um, is it not possible for customers to go back and print receipt on the application after you have been um, logged out? This is talking about um, notice of First Bank that after making transfers on their mobile application. Um, but maybe I should ask the person to contact First Bank, you know, for, for, more, for more of this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adeshola Adeduto. And um, thank you very much, Nigerian British um, Chamber of Commerce. I mean, for me, this has been a very engaging and insightful session. I mean, a lot of, um, a lot of things to think about, either as business owners or VC players or whatever um, your play is within the ecosystem. And um, this has been extremely insightful. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to introduce, um, I'm sorry. I would like to introduce uh, um, Mr. Unamdi Okunkwa to give the announcements and the vote of thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Kofo. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, our president has asked me to give this vote of thanks and announcements. So on behalf of the chamber, I would like to thank the keynote speaker, my friend and brother, Dr. Adeshola Adedunto, um, Ade First Bank CEO, moderator, Mrs. Kofu Akinkugbe of Secure ID, and of course our uh, sponsor, First Bank, the patrons and council members of NBCC, and all attendees here today. Now, the programs committee and the secretariat, I need to thank you especially because you guys have been working so hard, uh, bombarding us with reminders and documents and stuff. So um, Ayomide and um, our team, I'd like to thank you for today's session. And um, upcoming events, would like to inform you of some of the events that we have coming up at the chambers. In fact, we'll have one tomorrow, April 22nd. It will run from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And um, that has to do with the, it's a Nigerian-UK virtual trade mission on health care. The theme is building, financing, and implementing, uh, building, financing, and implementing a sustainable health care system. Some of our speakers tomorrow will be Dr. Agnes Sokat. She is Director for Health Systems, Governance and Financing at the World Health Organization, WHO. The Lagos State Commissioner for Health, Professor Akin Abayomi, and the DG of NAVDAC, Professor Moji Christiana Adeyeye. The second event, um, after tomorrow's would be on May 20th at 12 noon. That one will be specifically to meet the governor of Ogun State. I'm sure a lot of people, Ogun State is almost like a twin sister to Lagos. So everything that happens in Ogun State, uh, more or less, should be important to Lagos and indeed Nigeria, because these two, now you can hardly tell the boundaries. So we're inviting you to that seminar May, 20, May 20th at 12 p.m. So now talking about the chamber, if you're interested in becoming a member of the chamber, please visit our website, www.nbcc.org.ng. Finally, I'd like to thank the um, panelists and uh, bring this session. I'll hand over now to the um, president. Thank you. Thank you very much, Namdi. Thank you. I think you've spoken very well on behalf of all of us. And you thanked uh, Dr. Ade Dutton, who has done justice to the subject matter. And of course, Mrs. Ake Kube, thank you for being able to coordinate all those many questions. Uh, it is time to then put this session to the close. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And we look forward to seeing all of you at our event tomorrow.